I started dreaming about bees. Dreams came to me and I had so many dreams about bees. And that was the beginning of my life with bees. oneness in multitude. We have to look through the multitude to fully see the oneness. I remember when I set up my first log hive, a swarm had moved in and I could open one end cap to view the bees inside. And I remember to this day when I looked inside, it felt like the first human being stepping onto the moon, meaning it was nothing I'd ever seen before. It began with the formation of bees long before the first comb was visible in how bees were as a being, the shape, the movement, the intricate layers. Nothing by chance, everything on purpose, everything had meaning. And I had no idea what that meaning was. I realized that I didn't know anything about bees. Honeybees provide 50% of crop pollination services. In other words, if humans want to have agriculture and food, our fate is tied in with that one species. It's not unusual for beekeepers with their managed colonies to lose 40 or 50% of the colonies every year. And that's not what we're seeing happening in the wild. Having the bees in the wild is a genetic resource for us. These bees, that we keep in our boxes are still basically wild animals. They don't need to live in our boxes. They can live completely on their own. Rewilding honeybees means to reconnect to instinctual preferences of honeybees. We can mirror that in design and management. It starts with research in what conditions will be conducive to longevity. There are several reasons why colonies in the wild are having a higher survival rate than colonies living in beekeepers' hives. Part of it is a better genetics in the wild, thanks to the filtering of natural selection. But the other side is lifestyle, and there's a lot about the way bees live in the wild that is healthier for them. The bees are pretty choosy about where they nest. You might be surprised because the, what they are seeking in their homes are features that are quite different from what we provide them with in hives. They like to live high up in trees, almost none where the entrance is below about 15 feet up. That's, the, that's like the minimum. <laughs> Whereas the beekeeper's colonies are right at ground level, so the beekeeper can work them. Another big difference is the size of the home that the bees live in. A beekeeper's hive is two or three times larger than what the bees are using as a home site or nest cavity in the wild. The bees also like the entrance small, about one and a half square inches. There's an immense difference between the spacing of the nests of colonies living in the wild versus in a beekeeper's bee yard. The consequences of that are there's much more mixing of bees and that means if one colony has a high load of parasites, some of those parasites can be carried by the workers into neighboring colonies. We just don't see that going on in the wild. The Langstorff hive was invented in the late 19th century. At the peak of the Industrial Revolution, 
the steam engine came, cars came soon later, and the world had become a machine. And it culminated in the Langstroth hive. The nest, which had been round, becomes rectangular, it becomes a box, thin-walled, with straight frames, which force this being to abandon its natural ways. This way of beekeeping maneuvers outside of contemporary scientific research. 160 hives were set up here in an environment which doesn't support so many bees in terms of forage and food. They add cans on top which force feeds bees. A mixture of high fructose corn syrup, antibiotics, other pesticides. Those hives are so thin-walled, they're just trying to stay alive. But this is normal. Mm, it turns my inside over. There is no state or federal regulation to protect nor to grant them any basic rights. It's about making money and keeping this asset alive as if it's just a Wall Street operation. This shows us the consequences of that kind of commodity-driven thinking. Where are ethics and moral? Where is the respect for life? That we all belong to each other. That the way we treat this life form represents the way we treat ourselves. It really is such a motivator for a radical shift. We have to really wake up to who this animal is. We have to wake up to what it needs so we can really become stewards. What rewilding does is it puts the way we think about bees upside down, which means the right side up. And with this shift, our role as human beings shifts too. We are so used to thinking in terms of apiaries, having lots of hives in one spot and having to manage bees. What rewilding does is it allows the watershed to become the apiary. We foster and create the dynamic environment, which is then self-sustaining, and we find creative ways to link to it. Log hives, due to their natural nest volume, will swarm more frequently and generate locally adapted bees. And those swarms then can be integrated into our hives. It is clear our conventional ways of being on this planet, they are not really sustainable. We have to reconnect with a deeper and broader wisdom and knowledge. And that's what rewilding does. Rewilding is taking into consideration the biotic web of life at a time of crisis, in a time which asks for bold moves because we are running out of time. It's time now for us to move and to try something different.